one we don't like, Pixel Shift. Absolute garbage. I'll tell Whoa. you what it is. 187 megapixels. Holy crap. This just doesn't work in the real world. The tiniest, the tiniest imperceptible vibrations will completely ruin the shot. Breaking news. Canon launches a direct assault on Sony. This is real life. This is more detail than I can see with the human eye. Canon R5 is the best full frame camera for making high resolution images. Canon R5 is the best full frame camera for making high resolution images. Well, I clearly have too much time on my hands. Okay, so firstly, I am just being overly dramatic. Tony and Chelsea Northrup are amazing and they've been doing this YouTube thing for ages. They are absolute titans of camera tech and news as well. So I've left a link to their channel below, so go and check them out. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to take photos like this using the high resolution mode. And we're gonna have a look to see how that has made a difference to the pictures. Now, later in the video, I'm gonna also show you how to do that tutorial as well, via a tutorial, so you can skip ahead using the timestamp below. But first, I just wanted to use one of Tony's previous videos just to touch upon who is the king of high resolution photo photography or pixel shift mode. So six or seven months ago, he did a video looking at the Sony A1 versus the Canon R5, and that Canon had an amazing firmware update. And that firmware update included a 400 megapixel pixel shift mode, and the Sony A1 also has a pixel shift mode which can produce 200 megapixels. In that video, Tony had concluded that Canon was the best overall, but I actually think Panasonic is, and I'm just gonna do a real quick rundown of his list versus the Panasonic cameras. Now, as Tony rightfully points out, other camera systems have this too, including Fujifilm and even Pentax, but I think it's worth looking at the Panasonic camera because it's a full frame, a competitive camera it's a very current camera just like the, those cameras are current so it makes sense to give it a little bit of testing i can't test like tony test that's his like full-time job and he's awesome at it and as is chelsea but i'm just going to use his statistics that i read and see if i can remember them off the top of my old noggin uh, and we'll do a little checklist and then we'll get into that tutorial and i'll show you some comparisons some uh, tips as well as a secret tip at the very end so just make sure you uh, you stick around okay so firstly the sony a1 can do a 200 megapixel photo the r5 can do 400 megapixels and the panasonic can do 96 megapixels so if you're looking for brute strength and just raw megapixels obviously canon takes that round sony comes second panasonic come third second up i've got no idea how panasonic are doing their pixel shift mode so tony probably would know that there's like bayard versus full color he is a super super tech nerd and he'll probably understand that more than i do thirdly based on that video it looks as though the sony a1 can only do raw photos in camera and the canon can only do jpegs in camera the panasonic can actually do raw and jpeg at the same time not only that it can do raw and jpeg versions of those high res photos but it will also spit out a standard uh, jpeg and a standard raw photo too so it's taking a series of eight photos and one of those photos it will just give you as like a backup file which is absolutely amazing because if the photo doesn't turn out out how you wanted it to you still got that backup photo next up i believe it took tony around 17 seconds to get his photo on the sony a1 which in my opinion is far too long uh, some of that time was a countdown timer in the canon r5 i believe it was only a few seconds i think it was under like five seconds um, i've got all the specs on screen anyway and then the panasonic cameras well, it actually uses the electronic shutter instead of the mechanical shutter. So it can do instantaneous photos. And those photos take just under two seconds to take. I think I clocked it at 1.99 seconds. Now, I don't know if those cameras provide a high, uh, high resolution pixel shift mode in electronic shutter mode. So let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. But I'll give that round to the Panasonic with a caveat. Even though you could still do that mode instantaneously, you're much better to set a timer. Whether you're using handheld high resolution or on a tripod, you do want to avoid any movement. So set at least a few seconds. 
I tend to set, I think I set mine on the tripod to like eight seconds, just to make sure all the little vibrations have gone. Next up we have apps. So the Sony A1 will take photos in the camera, but it can't be processed and stitched together in camera. It has to be taken to an app where you can do all of that in post, including fixing the motion blur. Canon, on the other hand, will do it all in camera and actually produce really impressive results, resulting in Tony awarding the Canon the top marks and sort of the king of the hill sort of moniker. Whereas Panasonic, will also do all of that in camera. And again, not only that, but it's going to spit out high resolution RAWs, high resolution JPEGs, and standard RAW and standard JPEGs. And because of that, again, I think I would give the win to Panasonic. Also, in terms of file sizes, the Sony A1 will do a 600 megabyte file size, which is absolutely ginormous. The Canon will do a much more workable 96 megapixels. And the Panasonic's does around 117, but again, it's giving you RAW and it's giving you JPEGs. And because of that, I would give the win to the Panasonic. Now, finally, a couple of weeks ago, Panasonic announced the firmware update to the Panasonic S5 II and S5 II X that included the handheld high resolution mode. This allows you to use the camera all the way down to minus one second. Now, that is absolutely phenomenal. And from my testing, I think it's done a good, pretty damn good job with some little asterisks as well. And we're gonna review those photos in a little bit. So overall, which camera is king of the hill? Well, personally, it's clearly Panasonic at, at the moment. Sony are such great innovators and Canon come out with amazing stuff just out of the blue. So you never know, they might leapfrog each other. But as it stands today, Considering the Panasonic takes better advantage of the image stabilization over Sony, it has RAW and JPEG processing in camera. It will spit out backup files in, as standard photos as well. It's got a reasonable to work with file size and a handheld high resolution mode. It's clearly Panasonic. It also has one other mode, which we're gonna talk about in the tutorial, that I think is really good for creative purposes. So I award the high resolution race to the Panasonic S5 Mark II. Flawless victory. Unless you're shooting with a Fujifilm, which will just give you like 100 megapixels straight out of camera. I'm sure you wanna know how to actually use this mode if you haven't already. There is a great YouTuber who explains really succinctly how to update the firmware in your camera, and I'll leave a link in the description. Once you've done that, you're gonna press menu on the back of the camera. You're gonna look for the red camera icon. You're gonna go across twice. You're gonna scroll down to the high resolution mode and then you'll have handheld high resolution option. You can turn that on or off. If you're going outside, you've got not got a tripod, obviously you want that on. Underneath that, you'll have various options, including a timer, which is very important which you can set all the way to off, but I would, as I said earlier, use that timer to make sure, even if you're not on a tripod, you can brace yourself, because a lot of this is how you hold the camera if you're doing it handheld. You'll also have other options in there as well. You'll have RAW, RAW JPEG, um, combined, which will record just whatever your camera was set to in the first place. And once you've chose that, you wanna to go to your top doll, you wanna turn that top dial until it's in the high resolution mode. Now, when you take a photo, it will count down to whatever timer you set, then it will take a series of eight photos, and then it will take a moment to stitch them together as well. It doesn't take too long for them to stitch together, but there are a few things you need to keep in mind. So later on, uh, when we're looking at these pictures, the photos I was doing in studio, I was really struggling to the point where I thought, hang on, what is wrong with my camera? Wow, here's a few top tips. Number one, this mode definitely works better at a wider angle. Number two, you wanna have some distance between you and your subject. Now, the reason for this is I was shooting using a 24105, the Panasonic 24105, and the item I was photographing, I was very close to. So I'm all the way zoomed in and I'm very close, which meant that any exaggerated movement is even more exaggerated. And then what was happening was, as it was trying to process that file, it would just say it can't 
do this basically you can't process this file and just quit but this is actually kind of useful as well tony had mentioned possibly having a bail on fail mode and it looks as though the panasonic actually does have that built in which is even better and another point towards panasonic as well so i would rather not have 117 megapixel unusable file I'd rather just try and get the photo right or try and take it a different way. The very first photo we've got handheld of this cool Practica camera at 1 100th of a second at 105 millimeter. I'm going to zoom into 100%. I want you to have a look at the texture over here, the texture over here, and on this logo in particular. So let's have a look. Let's go in there and you can tell me if you can see any differences. So this is with high resolution mode off and this is with it on. You see it? Look over here, look at this trigger. I'm going to turn this off. Three, two, one. See, that's quite soft. Three, two, one. Nice and sharp. Let's look at this little area over here. I'm going to go into 200% now. This is super, super gross. Sorry about this. I'm going to turn this off. Three, two, one. And I'm going to turn it on in three, two, one. Okay, moving on. So this is handheld in the street at one tenth of a second. So I'll start from wide. I'm going to turn on HR in three, two, one. And then I'm going to turn it off in three, two, one. So this is off. Now I'm going to turn high res back on in three, two, one. I'm going to turn it off in three, two, one. Okay, so I'd say it looks a bit more contrasty, a bit more detailed. I've got to say here as well that. Um, I was walking really brisk to get into this tunnel, to get out of the rain, and the pulse in my hand was making the camera shake. So you have to take that into consideration as well. This is what you're all here for. This is one second exposure. The shutter was going chuk, chuk, super slow. I, it was so difficult to stay dead still. I really had to let my, myself calm down before I took this uh, photo. So it's off. I'm going to turn it on. Can you notice a difference? off on i can't tell a big difference it just looks a little bit sharper which might be hard to portray on youtube let's get into that curb all right we're at 200 percent now it is off and i can already see there is motion blur so this is just me trying to to hold the camera still now i'm going to turn high res on three two one that's actually that's actually mad that's I think it's corrected some of my motion blur. That's actually mad. So this is a lot more defined, the crack in this curb. Let's go into, we're at 300% now. I'm gonna turn it back on in three, two, one. Okay, interesting. Three, two, one, it's off. Okay, so kind of sharp, but I've noticed there's still motion blur here. Look at this here. I'm gonna turn it back on now in three, two, one. It's corrected that motion blur. Look at this area. I'm going to turn it off and on. Off. On. Off. On. That's really impressive. We're going to move on to handheld. Back at the retro camera at 1 200th of a second. And this is at 35 millimeters. Four steps back. So about four feet back. And we have got 1 200th of a second. Look how sharp that is. This is what I'm demonstrating here is I was really pushing the camera. You really don't want to be zoomed all the way in and really close to your subject with this mode. It's going to make it really, really difficult. But when you take your steps back, when you come out to a wider angle, it shines. And look at this. Let's zoom in. In fact, look at the detail. Really, really good. But I'm going to compare that now to standard high resolution mode now that means i'm on a tripod i've turned handheld mode off and i've set a 15 second timer to allow my tripod to stop any shakes or anything and i think this is really quite phenomenal so i think that looks really good but now this is the more controlled one look at this it looks absolutely fantastic it looks so sharp and so detailed and contrasty it just looks phenomenal. It just looks absolutely phenomenal. I'm really, really impressed with this. This is under controlled conditions where I think this technology works best, to be honest with you. It's great for product photography. I think it's done an exceptional job. And this was my secret. 
Now, if you use standard high resolution mode and you use the other motion processing mode, motion one, it will keep the motion there as an after image and that allows you to get creative like this. And you could use this to capture motion as I've done here or for whatever creative things you might be able to come up with and I'd love to know or see if you do come up with anything creative using this mode. Let's get back to me in the studio. Okay, so what are my conclusions? Well, my conclusions are I absolutely love this mode. Under the right conditions, it is really good. I think um, back, I believe in a really old video by Tony, he had mentioned art reproduction, something I'd never thought about, but that would be an amazing use of this setting. For me, I used to do a lot of product photography, and I still do occasionally, and I've used this mode in my product photography, and if you get your tripod locked down and weighted down, and you count a minimal movement in your camera, you get really, really good results. And the motion processing is really, really good as well. I don't think you have to be quite as careful as what other people have said, but you do want to try and minimize movement as much as possible. Although that might just be a testament to uh, Panasonic's sort of continued upgrading of this software. It might, it's probably a lot better now than it previously was, which obviously makes sense. And finally, I also really like the fact that Panasonic has the option to leave that motion in as an after blur or try and take that motion out that allows you to use the camera almost a little bit like a ND filter and you could capture motion on a waterfall or the photo I showed with the, the hand, real simple example. You could get some really creative shots and think outside the box. So if you see this video, I'd like to know what your experience with this mode is. Or I would also encourage you to go out and try it yourself and see if you can use this mode in a way that had not been previously thought of. And I would love to see examples of your work as well. So let me know in the comments below. If you like this video, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon. Don't forget to check out Tony and Charles's channel as well. It's in the subscription below. And I'll catch you all next time for another video. See ya.